I think it was his passion for, for, for heritage and passion for everything that he did. Um, uh, he was just a gentleman and, and passionate about, about what he did and uh, he, he was, he was uh, you know, a true uh, down-to-earth man. Uh, there was no airs and grace, no political correctness with Fred. What you saw was what you got, you know. And eventually I got a job as a joiner, which I'm glad I did. I served me time from being 15 years old till I was 22 years old as a joiner. And it, I think it's a great shame that apprenticeships, they've just realised, I think, at long last, that we should start again with apprenticeships because it's very important. I first heard of Fred in the late 70s. He used to be a window dresser. And it was right at the sign of the town hall clock. And I remember Fred, I didn't know what Fred Dibner then, swinging around on there, mending it, because I used to be always bloody annoyed he'd stop the clock, you see, and it was lunchtime. As time moved on, um, I went away from Bolton and became uh, an entertainer. And my mum used to send me cuttings of Fred Dibner out of the local paper, but I was what Fred had called a dolly girl then, you know, a dolly bird. I didn't want any part of a guy with a flat cap. And, um, I decided to watch him on television. Uh, I'll never forget that. I came back, I'd just come back from Morocco and I put the television on and there he was, Fred, on his roller. They stopped off at some pub, jumped down. He had Alison and the, t the three girls, one of them in arms and two little girls with him. And they went into the pub and poor long suffering Alison at the back of him. He goes, gets his pint and she says, oh Fred, the children are hungry. And he just goes, well, get on a packet of cheese and onion crisps then, cock. And I thought, oh God, I won't cooth, I can't stand that. And I leapt up out of the chair and switched it off. And I thought, no wonder they all think we walk about in shawl and clogs up north. <laughs> the thing is that I had this other fetish, the world of chimney stacks and steeples and, and steeple jackers. And it, and it became an obsession with me as I were, as long as I were going with a joiner, I was doing steeplejacking as well. I had two jobs going at once and I amassed 20 ladders. And when I finally went to do my national service, I, I, I did that two years in Germany and I came home and I thought, I'm going to be a steeplejack. And really I weren't quite well educated at all till then, you know. I started my life climbing up chimneys and church steeples and round Manchester it's raining more than it's fine. So when it rains you've nothing to do if you're a steeplejack, you know. So it's into the mechanic shop or into the boiler house or into the engine house. In them days there were great big 2,000 horsepower steam engines driving big spinning mills in Lancashire. Well that's a bit sad really, they've all gone, you know. But I learned a lot there, you know, there'd be one boiler down and the boiler makers would be mending it, you know. You can like pick up a book that's been written by an academic and it'll say the rivets are closed. It doesn't tell you how the bloody closed, you know, it just says this is how you, you know, you just do it like it says in my book. Until you've actually seen a man knocking rivets in a boiler or a man making chains, you know, it's, it's very difficult. I learn more by observation and asking questions than I ever did at school. When we were doing particular work on this, uh, you know, he might tell us the modern way of doing something and we'd say, oh, why are we not doing it that way? He said, oh, they didn't do it like that in four days. And it might have been harder or longer to get accomplished and all the rest of it. But because they did it that way in the old days, he just wanted to do it that way. So wherever he could, that's what he, he would do. He'd do it how they did it in Victorian times, yeah. Thirty odd years ago, if anybody has said you, 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 you'll end up making boilers, you know, riveted boilers that hold 200 pounds per square inch in your back garden. I'd have been a bit scared, you know, I, I, I would have, uh, wouldn't have known really what to say. 
But life's gone by and, and then along come the television into my life, you know, at first in, in the, to film the world of steeplejacking, which is a bit violent and exciting. And, you know, things can go wrong lots of times. And half of people who come to watch a big chimney fall down only come just in case something goes wrong, you know, and all of that. <laughs> and to, <laughs> touch wood for 40 years nearly, nothing's gone wrong, but there's been plenty of bloody days when it could have done, you know. It was a terrible day when we realised Fred had cancer. 29th of October 2001, we got a phone call from the hospital, go down uh, in the morning, so bring your wife, we knew it was bad. And um, went up to the hospital that afternoon to be told that they'd found a malignant tumour in the, the um, kidney that had been removed. Uh, obviously, you can imagine though, it was like a body blow. Everything was perfect up until that time. Fred was tough. The first thing he says, well, will it bloody kill me or what? But when we did sit down and talk about it, uh, he, he was, I'd never seen him like this before. It was determined, it wasn't, I thought he was in denial, it wasn't going to be a stage where he was uh, going to say, oh God, that's it, now my life's ended. It was like, I'll effing beat this baby, you just watch me. I've got too much to do to leave this planet. Yet, when we went to see the Christie's specialist and we sat in front of him and Fred says, go on pal, tell me how much time I've got left, give it us straight like. And uh, he says, well, Mr. Dibner, we don't really normally give out that information. He says, I won't bloody know. I've got too much do, cop. I want to know. And he told him, and he says, well, he says, you've got 12 months left to live. He says, maybe a little less, might be a little bit more, but you've got such a form of aggressive cancer here, we can't expect that you're going to survive. It's terminal. He'd been in their lounge because he'd been on their television and they thought he was talking to them. And when they met him, they would say to him, hiya Fred, and he would return back, hiya, are you all right, mate, you know? As though they were long lost buddies, never met before, you know, but that, that was Fred, you know, he, he loved his public. And even when we were doing the filming and his health got worse and worse and worse, he would still, he, he was in a lot of pain, put a good show on and, and be polite or whatever and, and make him feel, Welcome, you know. That first programme won Don Howarth a BAFTA. And after that came more programmes and Fred became an icon. This resulted, of course, thereafter in people dashing home to see BBC Two, eight o'clock, and see Fred on the television. I did that myself. I'd scream home along a motorway to get home, to sit down, to see the man who eventually would become a very close friend of mine. Paint, characteristically, pictures in words about his everyday work and the crafts and the passions he followed regarding industrial history. I enjoy coming down here when he was with us. But now I can't come down as often as I wanted to. I can't come down and do a bit of sweeping up. I can't do any polishing anymore. He was a, a right good, decent bloke. If you could love a man, he'd be friend. In a friendly way, that is. He was a right decent bloke. And it's sad that he's not here anymore. <laughs>